through Hollands and Hilly Lands, moving on and around Neolithic Mendip. So my research is exploring human movement at two very much contrasting Neolithic landscapes. Firstly, the Mendip Plateau in Somerset, which today's paper will focus on, and the Walton Basin on the Wales Herefordshire border. Around Mendip, oh, there we go. Uh, around Mendip, gorges and coombs, bless you, offer access uh, between the plateau top and the contrastingly marshy Somerset levels below. Many of you will have been to or know of uh, Cheddar Gorge, which leads up onto Mendip. However, at the Walton Basin, narrow, steep-sided valleys at the east and west ends lead to an expansive, relatively flat bottoms basin landscape, flanked on all sides, which I hope you can see on the top photo on the horizon, by very visually prominent hills and ridges. Both Mendip and Walton, in spite of their relative wealth of Neolithic archaeology, have been subjected to little interpretation as to how they worked as landscapes. But I hope that by developing a current, critical theoretical framework through which these important yet monumentally and topographically contrasting landscapes can be investigated will allow for a consideration of how human movement through and about them and the capabilities of the landscape may have influenced the placement of monuments and settlements alike and, may and how these ha may have, in turn, influenced the movement of people post-construction. Uh, so... Theoretically, I am taking a critical approach to as aspects of assemblage theory and actor network theory, the underpinnings of much of the relational thinking uh, currently in circulation in archaeology, in archaeological theory, sorry, and combining it with aspects of phenomenology. The implementation of relational approaches to archaeology has changed the direction of interpretive thinking in a series of ways. A. Non-humans, though I prefer non-sentient beings, have the same agentic potential as humans or sentient beings, or they are placed on a flat ontology, as Manuel Zalanda puts it. B. All beings are themselves assemblages, are made of assemblages, and are part of wider assemblages. They are the product of multiple actions, reactions, events, and forces that continually mould an ever-becoming being through time. Uh, C. A being's efficacy is not limited to that which, with, with which it comes into immediate contact. Its efficacy transcends the hierarchy of the chain operatoire, incorporating what might previously have been termed secondary or tertiary forces. So, for example, uh, a pot may owe its existence equally to the axe that chopped the wood that was burnt to fuel the pot, just as much as the hands that were, brought, that were used to bring it together, to use Oliver Harris's example. However, seemingly distant in the net network of actions that produce the pot these beings are, change any one of them, and the pot as we know it would not exist. D. Beings can have multiple meanings and be perceived in multiple ways by multiple people. Subjectivity was certainly central to the post-processional thinking, and post-processual and chiefly archaeological phenomenological thinking of the 1990s, a.k.a. Tilly, etc., um, but stemming from an object's agentic potential, in spite of desires to champion the role of the landscape, as Tilly wished to do in 1994, the process of cognition was still ultimately anthropocentric. Instead, objects or beings have innumerable qualities that they radiate out into the world. It depends on the observer's perspective which of these qualities are relevant or desirable in a given moment or instance. Employing Julian Thomas's uh, reading of cl the classical phenomenology in its standard form in the early 20th century, um, however, gets us much closer to this in the uh, in, in which relational landscapes are an internal, internally interconnected whole and inherently meaningful. Quote. Overall, this decentering of the human takes a fundamental part of archaeological phenomenolo phenomenology and flips it on its head. What results is a critical shift in the change of, chain of cognition from this on the left to that on the right. By applying this process to phenomenology, the landscape becomes a vibrant, active participant in Neolithic lifeways, as well as opening up a study of natural spaces in their own right, the likes of which Richard Bradley was calling for nearly two decades ago. Gorges and coombs may have facilitated secure and sheltered movements on much more gradual paths than the steep, exposed slopes. The rock shelters and caves in them may, have, may offer shelter from the elements. Conversely, a gorge's ability to gather mist and their different acoustic properties would have added, or could have added, sorry, um, an air of mysticism and trepidation to these places. Larger fauna, such as deer, have been observed to frequent the gorges too, as they do to this day. 
but uh, being attracted by the unique ranges of flora which themselves may have been recognised by Neolithic people. But these prey could have attracted other predators. Ridges along hilltops and shallow upland valleys, as in the bottom picture, uh, may stretch into the far distance in specific directions and serve as memorable routeways between separate landscapes and regions. So my research operates at varying geographical scales. Long distance movements of people, animals and objects during the Neolithic are being considered between my landscapes and those neighbouring them and beyond. Consideration to re regional monument typologies, ritual and social practices, and the distribution of raw artefact material also feeds into this. For example, at both of my study areas, flint is found in abundance, yet is native to neither. Old red sandstone uh, from Mendip serves as the raw material for quern and rubber stones found across central southern England, as in the top photo. Uh, in spite of them being found in close proximity to equally ideal sources of other sandstone types at certain locations, so people were choosing this stone type and bring it even though there are more ideal things, materials nearby. Um, at more local scales, movements around these landscapes and between their neighbouring hinterlands are being studied using, a relational the, using the relational phenomenological approach I've just described in order to, to explore whether natural topographies and features were utilised or harnessed to manipulate or corral human movements and experience. Each of these scales are relational to one another, so I hope these arrows are sort of demonstrating, uh, and smaller movements at local scales could have been nested within a series of broader movements. Importantly, understanding the duration and tempos of activity and, and practices at specific places is key to this, and all dated and dateable evidence is being collected, compared and considered. Certain signatures, such as multi-period lithic scatters, could have been interpreted as signifying frequent use of spaces that they return to time and time again, but may represent punctuated activities that last no more than a few hours at a time. Whilst earthworks at monuments may survive to this day, re revolutions in processing of radiocarbon dating and Bayesian modelling over the last decade suggest that monuments were, were only constructed and used over a small number of years rather than decades or centuries. Jody's paper earlier this morning illustrates how just such close tempos were taking place on or in Mendip. Um, I've been collecting primary data through the act of walking these landscapes, recording these walks with a body-mounted GoPro about there, um, stills of which you can see in the top left there, uh, which captures not only bodily movement but also tracks progress between and around spaces, sites and landscapes. I am then going to display these results geographically using experiential maps, something I am yet to produce but examples can be seen here. Uh, I've also add, I'll also add that the knowledge of locals, as we, as we all know, can prove invaluable at times. I'm not going to be handing out questionnaires for the public to fill out, but by chatting with locals, you can gather little nuggets of information that may not be written down anywhere, or hearing their own perspectives from their own intimate knowledge of the landscapes. And getting friends with locals might also be a way of dispelling any concerns of why a bloke with strange hair is wandering around some private land with a camera strapped to his body, but yeah, anyway. Um, rising out of the levels and river valleys of North Somerset, a large cast Carboniferous Limestone Plateau forms the Mendip Hills. Its highest points comprise formations of Old Red Sandstone, the sources of the Quins I mentioned earlier, including Blackdown, North Hill and Penn Hill, each cresting at just above 300 metres OD. Pollen and macro fossils, together with animal bones, indicate that during the Neolithic the landscape was a patchwork of open grassland with some acidic heathland on these old red sandstone peaks, and light woodland as well. Though some areas, for example the gorges, may have been more densely wooded, and overall this is a very similar landscape to the one that we know today. Its slopes rise sharply and dramatically on all sides, cut by gorges, as I hope you can see with Cheddar Gorge there, uh, cut by gorges and gooms on all sides, and, and which I argue but yeah, I'll argue that these gorges, in spite of the blastings and the rock clearances and the general erosion that they will have been subjected to over the last 6,000 years, uh, will not have really changed the ca overall character of these gorges. Um, as we've already heard this morning, caves and swallows are found across the plateau and they occur in higher densities in some areas than others. Um, <clears throat> I'll now offer a case study um, to explore some of these themes. Starting at Barrington Coombe, uh, there. 
the go this gorge cuts into the side of the Mendip Hills at its northernmost edge and serves today as a gradually climbing route that leads onto the plateau in the shadow of this highest peak, Beacon Batch, which you can see in the darker red patch there. This is a dramatic route with cliffs and, on, and steep scree slopes on both sides and cave openings visible <clears throat> both on the gorge bottom and higher up the slopes. Even walking past or coming into contact with these caves could have been, inter could have been an experience with social connotations in their own right. Caves are generally regarded as liminal places in many societies. These openings into the underworld are dark, wet, acoustically vibrant environments where breathing can become laboured due to the damp, thick air that's rich in carbon dioxide. Stalagmites and stalactites, particularly smaller ones, can sometimes resemble bones, which is interesting considering their presence at Aveline's Hole, uh, a site of, the site of an early Mesolithic cemetery. Rick Scholtinger speculated that some formations may have been present in the caves prior to Mesolithic inhumations, and I just wonder if maybe there was some suggestion that they could have been sort of mimicking what they might have interpreted as already there. Not the primary reason on that, though. Uh, this cemetery comprises some 20 or so skeletons placed only 20 feet from the cave entrance, and Rick Schulting has suggested that choosing the prominent location of Aveline's Hole, right next to the road, as you can see, um, as a burial site, could have been a deliberate act to ensure that the dead were visible to be engaged with, even if only visually. Associations with this world of the dead could have made for memorable, memorable experiences. Ascending the plateau summit, the landscape fans out. <clears throat> uh, continuing in a south east southeasterly direction, the modern road follows a ridge that skirts around the head of the valley that leads down past the area of Charter House and eventually to Cheddar Gorge. A dense concentration... No, sorry, wrong, wrong bit. Um, this morning, Jody's already explored some of these activities that took place at Charterhouse Warren Farm Swallows, <clears throat> and that lead-related materials like galena, top of the screen, um, could have been visible on the surface or where animals may have, dis may have disturbed the soil, quite an unusual material compared to the rest of the Neolithic environment. Uh, this ridge continues southeast, uh, though just to its south, the land dips ever so slightly and a very shallow valley runs parallel to it, along the line of the ridge, sheltered on both sides. A dense concentration of multi-period lithic scatters, dating as far back as the Mesolithic, follow this general line, <coughs> follow the general line of this shallow valley, which Josie Lewis has suggested and previously could indicate a long-standing prehistoric trackway or routeway. Later, a series of Bronze Age round barrows were con constructed following this line. Some in linear symmetries are at, or aligned to reflect this orientation, as you can see there, there, and sort of reference there as well. One of these barrows contained the stone lines kissed, with one of the side stones decorated internally with six, with cut marks and six carved feet, as you can see in the top photo. David Mullen has proposed that these could be referencing movement through the, this area and could be, and the, and it could be a long-standing tradition of user, utilizing this route resulted in it being immortalized in stone in this way. To this day, this is one of the main roads offering access to and across the Mendip Plateau, and the Roman road runs parallel to it, though it deviates slightly to the south at its northern end there, um, where it uh, terminates at the Roman lead mining works and settlement site. <clears throat> uh, at the bottom right, the pretty circles are aligned on uh, four middle Neolithic henge-like enclosures, henge-like in that they have external ditches and internal banks rather than the contemporary other way around, uh, straddling a gap between the two higher points of land dating approximately to just after 3000 BC. Each is constructed on a different geology, as has been suggested by Josie Lewis before, um, but this immediate area is one of the densest concentrations of swallows on Mendip. This is a geologically active landscape with swallows occasionally opening up to this day, and they have been known to swallow up tractors overnight. A study of the swallows may suggest uh, that many of these have been in existence prior to the construction of the circles, and it is possible that some of the swallows were directly incorporated into the architecture of the monument. A line of undisturbed ground crosses the swallow field just between that line there and the, and the modern road. As you can see, the Roman road runs directly through this gap um, in the Swallets. <clears throat> uh, but a closer inspection of the hashes, uh, which I don't know how well you might be able to see. Yeah, so starting about there and running just to about the end of the <coughs> picture there. 
Um, <clears throat> these hashes show that this portion of the Roman road is raised, standing proud of the ground level. And this is a phenomenon that runs for one and a half kilometers off to the southeast and occurs at no other point on its course in this concentration. Josie Lewis has recently published her suspicion that the Roman road was built on top of and could be fossilizing a pre-existing monument such as the Cursus, a typically early Neolithic monument type that predates the pretty circles, which could even partially explain their presence at this location. Such a monument could have offered safe passage through this uneven place that could have been packed with superstition and suspicion, as well as formalizing a routeway that could have stretched back centuries, even millennia. Further, this Roman road continues in an easterly direction before arriving at Salisbury, the heart of Flint country. And as I've already mentioned, Flint isn't natural to mend it. Could it be that this uh, followed a pre-existing inter-regional route that supplied Mendip with its lithic raw material running along the spine of the plateau. And so to conclude, I know I'm running out slightly over, um, to conclude, there is a general lack of applying relational theory to landscapes themselves, or rather the, the application of assemblage theory has been applied overwhelmingly to artefacts, and not so much to the broader scales that I'm sort of looking at here. Um, I hope that I have been able to offer a new perspective of looking at the landscape of the past. Uh, this assemblage, the assemblage that is the active geology of Mendip can cause drastic and sudden changes in topography and create new features themselves, assemblages. Their presence, concentrations and qualities reach out into the world, in turn stimulating human responses in the way that the people constructed monuments, chose where to settle for a night, um, <clears throat> which, place, which places to engage with and those to avoid ultimately affecting these, the paths they took or, or the routes they chose or were led to follow. These, mon these movements are operating at multiple scales from possibly inter-regional journeys to cross-landscape movements to within monument movements and past individual features all nested within one another. The lay of the land and its myriad characteristics do impact on our sense of place even in instances where we may not realise. Thank you.